we, we start out today with the absolute best panel. <laughs> so I'm, I'm your moderator, and, um, and General Gwen Bingham is our, our panel chair. I'm going to turn it over to her real quick because she asked me to be very brief on uh, introductions. In fact, she'll introduce the panel. But our, what, she is, it will kick us off as a, w with our panel, with opening remarks, and then each of our panel members will talk for about five to seven minutes, and then we'll go straight to questions. Um, to introduce General Bingham, um, most of you all know her. I would just say I've, I've known her for several years and watch her lead, lead soldiers. Uh, she is a hell of a leader and is the, exactly the right person we need as our accent. Over to you. Well, thank you, Keith. I really appreciate that. And good morning, everyone. Um, it's a delight to be here in General Ham and to Team AUSA. Thank you, sir, so much for having us here. We're excited to be here. And I got to tell you, I, I, t this morning I feel almost giddy like a school kid because uh, I'm sitting here with my joint service uh, teammates and Ms. Waboda uh, from the state of Maryland and, and Keith, whom I've known for a while. And it's just great to uh, share exchange and dialogue. Uh, Mr. Jordan Gillis got to start off on a great note this morning as our acting assistant secretary of the Army for Insulation, Energy, and Environment. And uh, Jordan did a great job. It's good to be your teammate and uh, as we continue to uh, uh, go about the business of insulation management. So uh, we teamed uh, in or in our teaming with uh, AUSA and General Ham. Uh, we thought it would be a great new story to uh, put on a panel that had representation from all the services because as we talked about joint basing during the last uh, set of questions, uh, what better way to be able to either answer that question or certainly to be able to learn from uh, our joint service partners than to have each of them here. So I'm delighted and say thank you to each of my comrades here and uh, Ms. Uh, Lisa Swoboda from the state of Maryland. Uh, to my right uh, and joining us today for our panel session is uh, Lieutenant General John Coop, uh, Cooper. He's the Deputy Chief of Staff for Logistics, Engineering, and Force Protection, United States Air Force. And Coop, it's great to have you here. I'd like to introduce Rear Admiral Charles Chip Rock. He's Commandant of the Naval District, Washington. Thank you so much, Chip, for being here. Uh, Major General Vince Colonace, he's the commander of the Marine Corps Installation Command. Vince, uh, always a pleasure to be in your company as well. And Ms. Le Lisa Swoboda, she's the director of Maryland Military and Federal Affairs. Thank you, Lisa. We appreciate having you. So uh, as uh, we kick off and, and uh, talk through some of the initiatives that are happening not only in the great state of Maryland with Lisa and on the joint service team, uh, we welcome your questions. Uh, we're going to speak for about five to seven minutes, each of us uh, a piece, and then uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Keith, who will facilitate the question and answer period. Uh, again, what an opportunity for us all to come together. And so I'll start off and, and just introduce myself briefly. So I'm the Army's Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management, or AXM, uh, to be short. Uh, I've been in my role for just over 20 months or so. I'm the principal advisor to the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Secretary on all things that pertain to installations, uh, soldier and family readiness. And so our team goes about our business looking at it from a total Army perspective. And Katie is here, my teammate, uh, as the MCOM commander. Uh, but we oversee the policies, programmatics, and the resourcing for the total Army. Uh, he has 75 installations. We've got 156 installations around the world. And so uh, where we focus our attention is the policies, the programs, and the resourcing for those 156 to include our Guard and Reserve and uh, Army Materiel Command. And we're very glad to have uh, Dan Mitchell in the crowd from AMC, and you'll hear from him later. Uh, we support our Army senior leaders' priorities, as Jordan has already laid them out for us all, uh, those being readiness, modernization, and reform, and always taking care of our soldiers, civilians, and families. So well-maintained installations allow our Army to deploy our forces, prevent conflict, shape outcomes, and conduct military operations. And I think all of us in this room understand that our current environment is a complex environment. And as installation, we must readily adapt. Uh, we're working with the Assistant Sec Army for uh, installations, energy, and environment to do just that. 
while at the same time we want to leverage the technology that Jordan introduced in his remarks the last hour. And so to that end, the Army is embarking upon what we call installations of the future, and uh, we are excited about that. I could have started my remarks talking about that, but uh, as Jordan mentioned before, we have Mr. Richard Kidd in the audience. I uh, don't want to steal his afternoon thunder, so do make sure, though, that you stay around uh, because I think you will really be encouraged by some of the initiatives that we're doing as we explore artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, and big data analytics for our future uh, Army installations. And uh, a lot of uh, my conversation has to do with infrastructure and facilities. I'll tell you right now that uh, we are uh, making good on the money that we are given to us. Uh, Jordan talked about that predictable, adequate, sustained, and timely funding. And so what we want to make sure we do is, uh, as good stewards of government resources is spend it in the best way to assure that we're getting after readiness. And so you can imagine that uh, we will never see at one time all of the funds that we need from a facilities perspective. So we are uh, really honing in on our most critical needs and prioritizing our infrastructure. As you think about installations of the future, big data analytics, think about being able to have sensors on buildings, though, that would tell us when there's a preventable fault that's happening to the building and would even be able to estimate what that cost would be. Gee, I look for those times because right now we're doing it uh, the best way we can through our installation status, result, uh, status uh, report. And while that works, it would be mighty nice to be able to have predictive uh, or have kind of a predictive maintenance capability on our buildings. So let me just highlight three areas uh, very briefly, energy security and resilience. I just want to foot stomp that one because that's an area where Jordan introduced that and we're excited about it. Uh, he and I got a chance to go out to Hawaii, Schofield Barracks, where we bore witness uh, to a 50 megawatt uh, plant that's almost ready. And what that plant will do, it will be able to uh, power up, if you will, the entire island of Schofield Barracks, uh, inclusive of um, a, um, a hospital and also all of Wheeler Airfield for 30 days. We're excited about that in the event of any kind of power disruption, uh, tsunami, or what might come, we're able to uh, power up the whole of Schofield Barracks for three days, or 30 days, rather. And so that islandable capability are, is where we're going in the future, and we're really, really, uh, really excited about that. Uh, Hawaii Electric Company is who we're partnering with with that endeavor. Uh, we lease them the land, if you will, and so they are totally owning and operating that uh, biofuel plant. Uh, but we get first call when we need to be able to uh, run uh, all of our uh, power and electricity in the uh, event of a disruption. So we are putting resources toward energy security and resilience because we know uh, that our military missions need both energy and water. Uh, the second area I'd like to talk very briefly about and introduce is uh, one that Jordan has talked about a little bit, and that is emerging, leveraging emerging technology to deliver services. And so uh, I'm really happy that my battle buddies are up here because I know they're addressing and attacking that as well. And so this is where we want to absolutely partner with industry. And uh, as we look at uh, utilizing best practices and divesting of missions that are not core to the Army uh, in the future. At Fort Meade, for example, uh, the, the Army took a modern approach to uh, single soldier housing by partnering with uh, Corvius, who is one of our RCI partners. And they built a, a apartment style living complex within the family uh, housing area for single soldiers. And so we absolutely want to examine the possibility of being able to expand uh, the benefits of privatized barracks, uh, perhaps, or adopted single living uh, in the future. Uh, new technology as we talk about artificial intelligence, robotics, big data analytics, all of those are on the table. So if you can think about any and all of the services that we currently provide in a, on an installation, and an installation is just a mini city. Uh, our garrison commanders out there are city managers, and they basically synchronize the services that are happening on our bases. 
So being able to utilize emerging technology. And so we are sending folks out to uh, various uh, locations. Microsoft, uh, Brian Foley was out there last week and and we also had uh, Willows in to talk to us a little bit about some of the work that they are currently doing. So we wanna continue to partner with our industry partners to leverage technology in the way that we're provisioning services right now. And you will always hear us talk about partnerships because I often said as a senior commander and a garrison commander before that, there's absolutely nothing we do inside our gates without the full support and partnerships of all of our community leaders outside our gates, our academic partners and industry to help us. We think that's a great news story. We welcome that as we begin to look at piloting our installations of the future. So I talked to Jordan one day and I said, hey Jordan, when are we looking to turn these pilots around? And he says, probably FY19. And so we are putting a mark on the wall, Richard Kidd, to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, Stay tuned, don't go away, because uh, we do have some some milestones on our calendar as we look to talk about installations of the future. And uh, all things very exciting. Um, there's a number of partnerships that I could talk about. I think KD plans to talk that on, uh, on his panel, so I don't want to uh, steal his thunder. Uh, but I want to say that our biggest uh, or our longest running partnership is probably with res- Residential Communities Initiative. That's our housing. Uh, we have, between that and our utility privatization program, we have saved more than $20 billion in capital investments to date. And in the energy arena alone, we've attracted over $2 billion in capital investments for energy efficiencies and renewable energy investments. We think that's a great news story. We intend to continue that long into the future, inclusive of any ideas of installations of the future. And so uh, industry partners, we look forward to partnering with you, uh, our local community and uh, academia. So uh, with that, I think I'll stop and uh, turn it over now to my Air Force comrade, Hoop Cooper. Hoop, over to you. All right, thanks, Glenn, and thanks to General Walker. And, uh, th- and thanks for the invite here. I think we'll have some, some good discussions and good, uh, uh, good questions. Uh, I understand joint basing was an issue this morning, so we'll, we'll probably get some questions on that. Uh, but this, these are always good opportunities to get together um, uh, with our joint uh, brothers and sisters to talk about what I think are common issues. And I think there's gonna be some common themes uh, amongst the comments this morning. Uh, I'll try not to duplicate some of your comments, but we're thinking a lot like the Army, a lot like uh, what you uh, just brought up there, uh, Gwen. So let me, uh, let me just summarize. I think installations uh, are an imperative for mission accomplishment. So um, it, the decisions that this body that, you know, when, when you leave this conference and you go back to your foxhole uh, at work, uh, you know, the, the decisions you make and the actions you take, uh, they gotta contribute to mission accomplishment. Um, uh, there's a, I mean, this is kind of our, uh, our burning platform, if you will. I mean, installations, I think all the services share the same, um, the sh- the same uh, issue. I mean, we've, the, our service, at least I'll speak for the Air Force, our, my service has taken risk in installations to pay and mod- to modernize in other areas. But we don't want to give up on installations. We just want to do it better, smarter, faster. So uh, the challenge is, you know, our investment to, uh, to our plant, you know, our plant replacement value investment has, uh, has, has come down over the, in the, you know, those sins of the past. As we look to the future, we don't see it getting much better. We want to make best use of those dollars as we go forward. So that the, the, um, this is a great forum to have those kind of discussions uh, and talk about it. So when I, you know, General Bingham said when the, you know, the Army installations to deploy from and execute mission, uh, from the Air Force, we deploy from uh, we, but we also have to deploy too, because at the Air Force, you know, we, it, we, when we go forward, where the Army and the Marine Corps and Navy operate in a, a scheme of maneuver, uh, the ground scheme of maneuver, the Air Force goes to a base. That's what we fight from. Uh, we're changing our model in that. Be glad to talk about that during question and answer. But we go to our base, so it's really imperative that we, with whatever dollars we have, we focus on the mission um, that's uh, that's relevant and what, whatever we can execute. Um, so bottom line, we're looking to become more efficient, more, uh, more effective, uh, more lethal uh, through our installations. How, how can we make that happen? So in keeping with the, the theme of this, of this conference, the installations of the future, I'll just give you one word, uh, innovation, right? So there's a, there's a lot of industry here in attendance, and I'll tell you, we rely heavily on, uh, on industry as well as ourselves 
uh, for innovation, and I'll give you a couple in these prepared comments and be glad to talk about it during the, uh, during the question and answer. But these are exciting times. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, I feel like I'm living in a sci-fi movie uh, <laughs> because everything I've seen in sci-fi movies seems to be coming true. <laughs> Uh, in, in all this, all the uh, uh, IT, big data. I just saw the USS Enterprise get taken down by a, a swarm of drone spaceships this weekend with my, uh, with my son. We watched Star Trek III, man. And then I, I went in on Monday and made sure, you know, how much money are we investing in swarm technology for counter UAS? Because, hey, it's coming because somebody in Hollywood put it in a movie, right? So uh, these, are, these are the, I mean, these are really the times that we're in. I mean, if you think back to where we were versus what we have now, this is exciting times and a lot of opportunity. Um, you know, and we're trying to change a lot of things in the Air Force to, to embrace this change in technology uh, that's really escalating. The first thing we're trying to do is change the way we think. Um, you know, I would say in the past, installations was, uh, was all, all installations was local. It's like all politics is local. You know, all installations was local. Uh, and we really got to get out of that mindset where we got to give the local commander, that local commander has to have opportunity to innovate and provide for his or her uh, airmen, troops, sailors, Marines, uh, soldiers. Um, but at the same time, we have to take a, an enterprise view to try to get those goods and services uh, as efficiently as possible so that they can be as effective as possible at the, at the, uh, at the front. We also recognize that good ideas come not only from the three-star you know, they don't come from on high down. They're not, they're, they come from everywhere. In fact, we're finding a, a lot of great ideas, and we're implementing a lot of great ideas, and I'll be glad to share some. I'll have a few in these comments from the ground up. You know, airmen at the edge are coming up with really good ideas and are able to do it um, um, through, um, through innovation at the local uh, level. Um, and then we've got to change our mindset. How, how do we think? Can, can, can we actually accept failure? You know, this, this fail fast, it's easy to say. But as an institution in the Air Force, I know we, we, we struggle with failing fast. We don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but we're trying. And we, got, we have signs that this is actually working. You know, if you go to the Air Force um, uh, Civil Engineering Center, um, we've instituted, they, they've instituted a model where they pull all the, all the base activities together, and we're trying to, when we're trying to figure out what, what base are basing decisions. They pull all the information together. We used to look at it in stovepipes. How long is the runway? How far from the community? What's the sound distance? Uh, we pull all that together, um, and it's, it's, it's brought together in a holistic uh, method, which saves weeks of time, a lot of effort, and gets the emotion out of, uh, gets the, emotion out of the decision, goes more towards, uh, towards facts. Another area where we're really, we're really excited about is a, uh, we call it CyberWorks. Uh, we started at the U.S. Air Force Academy. Uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a partnership <coughs> with industry and academia. Um, and they, it's not, it's not installation specific, but they took installations as, an, as, a, as a use case to try to figure out how can we optimize, how can we optimize our space and use the, um, you know, uh, energy analytics and try to figure out how to, how to, uh, how to best support an installation. Um, it's, a, it's a first work. Uh, it's, it's a really a first uh, cut. Uh, we didn't learn much from it, frankly, but we learned that the idea of doing it like that makes sense and we ought to uh, ought to keep on um, going on that I mean we had lots of so we had the Air Force we had students we also had 10 industry partners in, in this cyberworks activity trying to come up with good ideas uh, to help the Air Force go uh, you know become bigger stronger faster um, and so we're trying to think we're trying to change the way we think we're also trying to change the way we do business and I, I'm going to uh, echo what General uh, Bingham said and that's uh, partnerships I mean you know, we're all very familiar with uh, public-private partnerships, uh, but I'd say it's over the last couple of years at least, it's, it's taken on a new, a new turn. I mean, we, we're very, we're all, in, if you're here, you're probably very familiar with enhanced use leases and community partnerships where they build something for you and you get to use and you, you share things like that. Now we're moving into the, into the IT data and cyber world. Um, you know, recently, uh, two of our bases, Barksdale and, um, and Andrews right here in D.C., a team with uh, IBM Watson to try to do a, 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 a you know installation optimization tool to, to, to get the best use, best uh, drive the the, uh, the constant you know the, the cost down, uh, and go from there. Uh, we're doing the same thing at Maxwell with security. We're using AT and T is using some analytics for that, uh, and we'll, those are just a couple examples of where we're where we're heading. Um, 
And then the third, the third area that I'm excited about is uh, one word data. I mean, you you brought it up, Gwen, but and if you're not talk, if you don't have data in your, if you're not talking data in the Pentagon, you are just not cool right now. Uh, you know, you've <laughs> got to be talking about data. We just stood up a, a chief data officer, two star command or billet, not a command, uh, working directly for the SecAF, uh, Secretary of the Air Force, and that uh, we were we were very happy because they started out with just five use cases, and one of those was installations, and how do we get the best bang for our buck with installations? Uh, not not unlike how Walmart does it. You know, if you look at Walmart, Walmart's got really old technology, but they got really good analytics, um, and they're able to, to turn that cycle really quick. We're looking to try to, to harvest uh, and learn that. Um, so those are just a couple of, couple examples. Um, we're we're using stuff in, inside the visualize and in the building. You uh, many of my colleagues have seen this thing we call um, uh, installation health <laughs> assessment. It's got every building, every facility in the Air Force on one chart. And it's a pixel, and it, it it can show over time if we're spending this much money, our our palm, it will do this to the to the buildings, mission support, mission, and service support, and it kind of shows the pic pictorially. We couldn't ever done that even five even three years ago. Now we're able to do it, uh, so really excited about that. So I'll, I'll kind of stop there, and I know that we'll have very uh, similar, or we'll have similar comments here, and a lot of questions on that. And I look forward to your comments. Thanks. And I'll turn it over to Major oh. General Colonnades. <laughs> okay, so the movie I'm thinking about is Minority Report. <laughs> yeah. So actually, actually, when they made that movie, um, Spielberg went out and he asked the industry, uh, "What what is actually uh, realistic in technology in the coming years?" And, that, and that's how they did it. And so when you think about that, uh, everything I'm going to say is 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 parallel or the same thing. I think everybody's doing right. Um, in the Marine Corps, we kind of do things cheaper. Uh, so, we, you know, we, we have a two-star. You take the Air Force's money. Yeah, we take the Air Force. We'll take your money any day. Uh -huh. um, but in, in the MCI Comm Command, I mean, we have a smaller portfolio, but I, we kind of, I do both. I have the Assistant Deputy Commandant's job, so kind of the programming side, the LF side, and also the uh, command side. Um, nowhere is the size or scope of the Army uh, or, or, or the Air Force as, uh, as a portfolio. What we're doing is, uh, so is innovation's a topic, and we have several vectors in it. And I think we, the Marine Corps has always done, I think, uh, innovative, you know, thinking and, and, and operations throughout, throughout our history. And uh, my boss, General Dana, really uh, is, uh, and, and the Commandant's really big on this, and they did, we're doing a lot on, we're doing a lot on the uh, operational side, uh, and what I think we were missing and not doing a lot on is on, on the installation side. And that's where I think we have the, actually the most uh, bang for the buck to do it. So c the image I have when, when we talk about data is a, a cloud over that installation. Amazon Cloud, Microsoft Cloud, whatever that cloud is, right? You can say hybrid type of operations. And that cloud, everything's a sensor. Everything's a sensor on a base. But we don't have things integrated. We don't have uh, – and so – one of the top, my top priority is actually uh, is force protection security, because that base is the only purpose. Of that base is to generate combat power, both time in time of peace, uh, and, and in war. And then more, more than likely, if we get in a kinetic fight overseas, we're going to be attacked in the homeland, whether through cyber, whether, uh, any any type of attack, um, insider threat, whatever. Uh, your imagination is, uh, is it's, it's likely and to happen. So we have to have a resiliency and be able to generate combat power uh, regardless of, of uh, that type of attack. So you have that cloud, you have everything as a sensor tied in, and then you have the anomalies. You go through a gate, uh, one of our bases, Quantico, is really an open base. Um, it has a train station in it, for God's sakes. And you, if you go into the town of Quantico, you really, we can't really stop them. So, you should go through that gate. There should be a license plate reader, a facial recognition, association of vehicle and person, phone, and everything else. And that person deviates from going to Quantico and goes straight. I mean, instead of going to Q-Town, go somewhere else. That's an anomaly, and military police should know it, and then we should uh, not, not necessarily send a drone to kill the individual, but, you know, <laughs> stop them. Right? Trying to keep people out or right, right. Marines from here. Yeah. <laughs> just, just certain services there. Um, 
but 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 anyway, a couple of things we're doing on the other things. We're going to, Blunt Island is a is is a, a basically a logistics base where we do our maritime uh, preposition ship uh, offload and stuff. So we're we're going to we're buying some commercial drones, going to fly them geolocator and see how that ties into the uh, military police. How do we do that? Right now we have a military we have a a, a, a boat. That goes out there because of the explosive arc. And I'm saying, why are we using a boat? It's a lot more expensive. Why don't we just use drones? And then, if somebody breaches that 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 uh, inner circle, then you send a boat to intercept and stuff like that. I mean, not really high tech or anything, but it's a, a, a way of thinking and doing it. And then some of the things we're doing in the installation, I believe, we can then trans um, transfer them up to the operational forces. We're partnering with the Marine Corps War Fighting Lab uh, to do some of these things so they can use some of their um, things on our installations. I see our installations as, as a, a test bed. Uh, you know, we own the air, land, and sea, and why not use our installations uh, for, to innovate and, uh, and try these things out? Uh, I talked about energy resiliency. I think we're all trying to do the same thing. We have several microgrids out there, but I think we've done it, you know, depending on personalities and, and base commanders and, and, and certain leadership I don't think we've done it in a holistic way. Is what's the prioritization of, of where do we want to? What's the most important base for generating combat power? Um, you know, keeping the runway going if we're if we're in Miramar to 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 get to generate the sorties and get them overseas. Um, looking at it very holistically in the prioritization, and then invest wisely uh, as we do that. Like I said, for the generate combat power, mobility. We're doing things on mobility. We're autonomous vehicles in uh, in Miramar. Um, we're working with Lyft in, uh, in uh, Camp Pendleton, and the idea is if, if we can get our, our, our spouses and, and military members um, licenses, if you will, for Lyft, um, now they can make a few bucks, you know, buy some uh, for pizza, beer, whatever, uh, in their off hours uh, at, at their will, right? And then we, 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 we get licensed drivers who have a, a CAT card able to come on base and then what they're able to do is then uh, pick up Marines who want to go out in town San Diego whatever and the problem before was if you can get on base the cat card but the driver itself wasn't allowed on base if he didn't have a, a, a cat card so if the driver is a military member uh, we win-win uh, in that and then we're asking Lyft they're working with them is to actually get have like a um, in the menu itself that annotates that, that person is clear to come on base because it's a military driver. So uh, there's, that's not great in innovation or anything like that, but it's, it's processes and how we partner, uh, as was mentioned before, with Lyft. And, and then the second phase at Lyft would be we're considering why do, why do we even have military vehicles driving us around if we could have Lyft drivers on base, get rid of our, our white flea, if you will, and literally have Lyft uh, uh, drive people around. And instead of renting a vehicle and, and going to the base and spending a lot of money for a rental vehicle, why wouldn't you just have Lyft not only get you to base, but get you around the base itself? Um, so a lot, of, a lot of things going in that um, training and support rangers, how we do rangers. You know, we always love the Army rangers. We always thought, man, they are really high tech. They got pop-up targets. You know, we used to have dirt and and, uh, and cardboard out there, right? And then we went and put a lot of money in our installations, ranges and stuff, and now we got some high-speed ranges. But we're saying, do we really need those ranges like that? What about if we have a, a range that's flat or hilly, and then we use autonomous targets, vehicles, and things to engage the offense or defensive uh, maneuvers on the base itself? Uh, and you could, and that's out there. We're, we're doing some stuff with that, too, as opposed to very expensive to maintain some of these installations, uh, targeting and, and personnel that goes with it. So that's just a few things in it. Uh, I, I look forward to your, your questions. And, and uh, like I said, we have several other vectors we call that we're looking to innovate in. Well, good morning. And before the panel uh, started, I had the, the privilege of meeting General Ham, who was giving me some background about uh, this morning, given the fact that I'm the kind of an oddball up here. Uh, on, uh, and he said, this is generally a, a, a friendly audience. Uh, he said, but, but if the audience turns, they're going to take it out on the Navy. So, so I, I, I look forward to that. Um, 
My, my name is Chip Rock, and uh, as introduced, I'm the Commandant of Naval District Washington. Um, my boss is the Commander of Navy Installations Command, Vice Admiral Mary Jackson. Uh, as a little bit of context, uh, there are 72 Navy bases around the world, and we break them up into 10 geographic regions. Naval District Washington is one of those, one of those 10 regions. I don't know if I'm going to have anything earth-shattering that hasn't already been touched on uh, here this morning, but I, I think that is, uh, that's good news, that we all share some common challenges and, more importantly, some, some common opportunities. Uh, about a year ago, I was reading in uh, Wired magazine an article about what a smart city would look like on a base. And it was, a, it was an interesting, compelling art, uh, article about um, having technology distinguish between uh, base workers, residents, and visitors to the base to improve traffic flow during high peak hours, start of the day, end of the day, special events. It talked about uh, m measuring the, the, the fullness of trash cans or the stocking of shelves in, in our commissaries um, and using that technology to do um, activities um, uh, in, in a more efficient and effective way. And, and while that seems somewhat futuristic, I, I think uh, the, the Navy is close to employing some of this interconnecting um, technologies on our installations today. We've published a couple of years ago a, a document called um, uh, Shore Vision 2030, where the, th the theme is how we create uh, an installation uh, the, at the right place, so the right bases in the right place with the right capabilities for for the right price. And and, and I'm going to touch on uh, a, a, a couple elements of of that document, but m like, like we've already heard this morning, it's about leveraging advanced technologies, about sound investment, and then intelligent sustainment of that investment. Uh, but I think that the challenge, at least from a Navy perspective, and I think we all share this, is, is defining what those right capabilities are at the right place and what does that look like for our installation. So I thought I'd give you a couple examples of, of uh, where the Navy is at with, with regards to um, developing some of these smart technologies on our base and then uh, touch on uh, partnership opportunities uh, uh, as, I, as I finish. So in terms of leveraging the smart city concept, um, I, I think there are six areas where um, we're in um, some state of development on our Navy bases, mostly in infancy, and where we could use some help is bringing, bringing some of this together. First is, uh, to General Colonnese's point on um, security and force protection. You know, how, how, do we, how do we automate our physical security at our installations through video management and, and analytic capability that cues operators um, to deploy security forces, um, the electronic tripwires, if you will, on the perimeters of our installations. And then how do you use that, bring that data that is sourced from those sensors into, into some common operating picture that can then be used to uh, support decision makers on the installation, whether it be uh, a, a security challenge or, more importantly, deployment of consequence management and emergency management personnel. You know, so you have a, a fire in a building and you send, a, you send your fire chief uh, to the scene. He's got an iPad. He already has the schematics of the building. We're already uh, started uh, negative ventilation in the building. Sprinklers are activated. He knows exactly where to go, knows the exact condition of the building before walking in. Doesn't exist today, but, but the capability sure does. Microgrid capability, we talked a little bit, heard a little bit about uh, energy, but uh, how do we leverage local power generation companies um, uh, to, to improve both our, our resiliency uh, and, uh, and our efficiency on our installations. And we've got some lessons and in, in, in some, some opportunity that we can talk about in the, uh, the Q&A. Uh, in terms of uh, censoring buildings, 
how, how do you tie the, the access control of the, 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 the security sensors to your environmental um, systems of your building so that, that you, you actually control the, uh, the environmental systems in the building based on demand, based on access to that building? Uh, I think a, a, a good opportunity to get after some energy savings there. And then the last is uh, some smart grid initiatives, uh, and, and that's, that's moving away from preventative to predictive maintenance for our uh, building, building control systems um, in, in trying to reduce the, the, the huge bill, our number one bill in the Navy for our installations, and I think we share this is, is, is energy costs. And then uh, automated uh, induction of work. Uh, so you predict a failure of a system in a building, and then uh, that's automatically fed uh, to, the, to the maintainers, and you automatically generate a, a, a trouble call associated with that. Uh, in terms of uh, privatization, lots of uh, success stories. Uh, housing privatization is one of them, and I won't, I won't steal uh, Lisa's thunder in, a, in an example, but when you have the Navy and the state of Maryland boasting about um, a privatization effort at our Naval Surface Warfare Center in, in Indian Head, and I think you're, you're going to touch on that, and I'll let you, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you uh, talk to that. And and I think there are plenty of uh, opportunities with regards to uh, energy partnerships on our installations. And I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Good morning. So I love starting out a day uh, when you can learn something new, and, and I've learned here this morning that for some, I won't walk away being remembered as the director of Maryland's Office of Military and Federal Affairs, but rather as relative of Ron Swoboda, go Mets. So. <laughs> Uh, in Maryland, we have over 20 military facilities, of which 12 are major military installations. Um, it, quick shout out to Aberdeen Proving Ground, uh, who uh, was just uh, honored uh, by the Association of Defense Communities uh, as the uh, Defense Community of the Year, receiving that award this June, so congrats to them. Um, we have over 60 civilian federal agencies, too, uh, here in our state. Uh, 74 federal labs, uh, which is twice as many as any other state. So in Maryland, research and development, RDT&E, is, is huge, and innovation is a, is a really big driver. Um, our economic impact of those 12 major installations alone, not including the overall defense spending, is roughly about $57.4 billion annually on the state of Maryland. Recognizing that it's a big economic driver, as I mentioned, our military installations are innovation drivers. And innovation is what is driving regionalism, our regionalism, uh, and also building entrepreneurial ecosystems in our state. In Southern Maryland, as part of a, a defense industry adjustment program and a grant that we received from uh, DOD's Office of Economic Adjustment, uh, we created a patent database um, of the patents um, that are available for licensing uh, out of the four Navy labs in Southern Maryland. I say four Navy labs. We included, as I said, driving regionalism. Dahl, uh, Dahlgren was included in that, uh, being just across the bridge from us from Indian Head. Uh, so looking at Indian Head, Pax River, Dahlgren, and NRL, uh, which has a component in Southern Maryland, there are about 1,700 patents, uh, technologies that are available for licensing. So we looked at that and, and tried to figure out how best we can support the Navy in pushing those technologies out to the commercial market uh, and also creating opportunity within our state. So the state of Maryland partnered uh, with the region and with the Navy to create uh, regional innovation centers. Uh, the one that I know that uh, Admiral Rock had began to mention was, or is, the Velocity Center, uh, which is going to be outside the gate at Indian Head in Charles County. An educational partnership agreement was signed between the College of Southern Maryland and uh, the Naval Service Warfare Center, Indian Head Explosive Ordnance Disposal Technology Division, 
to create an off-base velocity center that will complement the on-base top secret work being conducted in the velocity lab within the Navy base there. Uh, this collaborative workspace aligns the strategic plans of the tenants uh, on Indian Head as well as the College of Southern Maryland Entrepreneur and Innovation Institute, the state and the county. Uh, the center will enhance uh, the EOD mission there at Indian Head, provide greater military value for the overall base and community, all while demonstrating the community's commitment uh, to the base in that region. Uh, College of Southern Maryland will serve as the primary tenant, uh, but the EOD uh, technology division there will lease half of the space in the Velocity Center off base. The state's committed $500,000 towards that effort and secured funding, additional funding for the demolition of one of the buildings in which the, the center is to go on that site. Additional funding is secured from the College of Southern Maryland and our Military Alliance Council of Charles County. In Maryland, we have seven military affiliated alliances uh, throughout the state supporting their respective defense community. Uh, and the state provides grant funding to each of those seven military alliances to help them advocate and support the missions on their respective installation there in the community and make sure that there's a, a mutual uh, beneficial arrangement partnership that continues to occur so we can continue to grow not just the base uh, but then also its community, surrounding communities. Uh, the other innovation center in Southern Maryland uh, that we've helped stand up is Aeroport. Uh, it is a um, incubator that is adjacent to the FAA uh, designated UAS test site in Southern Maryland, uh, about a couple miles uh, from the Pax River gate there. Uh, the Technology Transfer Office at the Naval Air Warfare Center Aircraft Division, NOC AD, received federal funding to establish a business incubator. Uh, the Tech Transfer Office there allocated the funding to Maryland um, TEDCO, a technology economic development arm here in Maryland, and then partnered with St. Mary's County to establish the incubator. The University of Maryland will operate it, uh, bringing research expertise and resources that parallels the likely technology fields that will be incubated there in support of the NOC AD mission. Uh, it's a win-win for the community, for the Navy, and for the university. Uh, we had a ribbon cutting for the incubator this past December. Uh, another piece that I think that you were going for, not necessarily the Velocity Lab, uh, is we have three site designations in Maryland, and for those that aren't familiar with site, which is the Center for Industrial and Technical Excellence, they're a little bit different from your, your center of excellences. Um, Indian Head being a, a site designated facility, and that really can be a draw for industry. Um, we are helping uh, the Navy promote that site designation, uh, which has attracted, uh, right now, I believe there are over a dozen uh, industry partners uh, looking to um, partner with Indian Head and, and relocate nearby uh, to take advantage of the facilities and the labs there on the base in a collaborative uh, workspace environment. Uh, and that includes uh, NAMO, which I think we can publicly talk about, um, is a, a warhead manufacturer that is, is looking to uh, go into a, a partnership agreement with the Navy to be located there on Indian Head. Do you have anything to add to that? Okay. Moving out of Southern Maryland uh, and, and still touching on innovation, uh, in Northeast Maryland uh, near Aberdeen Proving Ground, the state of Maryland in partnership with the uh, RDECOM labs that are hosted at Aberdeen Proving Ground, um, which is CERDEC, ARL, and, and ECBC, Edgewood Chemical Biological Center. Uh, we have entered into uh, MOUs with each of those labs and have opened up what we're calling the Maryland Defense Technology Commercialization Center, DEFTEC Center for short. Uh, this is a, a physical space that is housed off post and that will provide office space for the technology transfer offices. Each week they'll be taking space within these offices, and the goal is to promote the commercialization of Army technology in that community, 
uh, to educate scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs about entrepreneurship, intrapreneurship, uh, and opportunities uh, to work with industry and academia to support the commercialization effort. The, uh, how we're doing this, just very quickly, besides the physical space, as I said, we've got the MOUs with the labs. We also have an advisory board that has been created that will guide the DevTech Center. Our advisory board, we've partnered with industry, government, and academia. Each of the technology transfer offices and the labs are on that advisory board. And again, our funding source for that, uh, thankfully, was uh, Department of Defense Office of Economic Adjustment. So thank you there. <laughs> And uh, lastly, and very quickly, I want to mention uh, the Fort Meade Education and Resiliency Center. So not talking necessarily energy resiliency, but talking about the wellness of our military and their families. Uh, in partnership with the Fort Meade Resiliency Working Group of the Fort Meade Community Health Promotion Council, the Fort Meade Alliance, which is one of our seven military-affiliated alliances, uh, partnered with Fort Meade um, to help develop their resiliency campaign. This was after the Army launched their 2013 Ready and Resilient campaign, a uh, comprehensive plan to address uh, the needs of our, our active duty, reserve, and National Guard and their families. Uh, the Fort Meade Alliance, uh, along with the state, uh, conducted a needs assessment uh, and a gap analysis of resiliency programs. And what we found out on Fort Meade was that these programs and services were very fragmented throughout the entire installation. Uh, and what the, the partnership was able to do with the Alliance and the community was to um, publish a campus map of the existing services while um, the Fort Meade Alliance Foundation worked on a capital campaign to raise funds to fully renovate and outfit a new resiliency center for Fort Meade. Um, Fort Meade has over 55,000 employees uh, that work daily on that, that Army base, and uh, there is a great need um, for these, these programs and an expanded need uh, of services. So the, the, Fort, the, the Army identified Coon Hall, an existing um, old DBQ on base that's going to be fully renovated. Uh, the state has put forth $500,000 towards the renovation of, of the center. And once completed, the Fort Meade Alliance Foundation will deliver back to the Army a completely renovated center for their use. Uh, target construction date is late this fall with a scheduled opening in late spring of 2019. So we look forward to that. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Let's get right to questions. This first one is for everyone. Um, in light of the uh, recent school shooting in Florida, uh, much debate about role use and control of firearms in public places. Um, so at each of you comment, are there changes that you are looking at in uh, security of, of on-post schools and bases when you have them or in how you uh, rules for service members carrying privately owned firearms? And General Bingham, if you'd kick us, start us off. <laughs> I looked at Katie when you asked that question. Um, certainly, uh, that's an evolving uh, conversation, and the decisions uh, are forthcoming, perhaps. Uh, Any time that, though, I will tell you as a senior commander, uh, you always want to safeguard your forces, uh, your military and civilian and families that are on your bases. And so in, in light of that, uh, I live with an educator, my, my spouse, uh, who is uh, working through his administration with that, uh, the answer to that question. And so um, we certainly are looking at ways to make sure that we preserve and protect our forces, our, our soldiers, civilians, and families on the base. Uh, we have not uh, come out with new policy as it relates to that as we look to uh, what our senior leaders will look to do on that subject. Anything different? Uh, so we did a tremendous amount of work after uh, Chattanooga uh, a couple of years ago uh, to, to, uh, on, in the Air Force to an in, in institute really reinvigorate a one program, the LEOSA Law Enforcement Officer Safety Act, which lets uh, credentialed law enforcement uh, uniform wearers to carry concealed weapon on base. You know, kind of like you see in, on TV, you know, you can hold your badge. And if you have a weapon, you're okay. Um, we instituted a unit marshal program where uh, you could be sitting at work at your computer if you're staff and, and your 
um, directors uh, have the option to arm um, people as a blocking technique uh, until uh, until uh, a force can come to uh, arrest the problem uh, or engage a problem and then um, staff arming uh, security forces squadrons we implemented all those about three years ago now I, the only reason I bring that up is because schools are where we are focusing on schools I think everybody's looking at schools now and I know that we're uh, uh, the Department of Defense Education Agency is going to be looking at the, the school protection that's already in our policies to uh, to, in, to incorporate schools into the uh, the regular the regular reviews annual reviews look at the both construction and procedures and inspections and all that kind of stuff we really haven't changed anything we're, we're uh, grounding ourselves now to, we're reviewing the bidding we're going out to all the schools uh, led by Dodia uh, going to review the bidding and uh, we'll see what happens Yeah, we, we made a lot of, I'm saying improvements, especially on recruiter stations uh, right after their shooting, uh, ballistic glass and things like that, and reviewed it. Uh, as far as policy changes, um, that'll come from the commandant, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to announce any policy changes, if, even if I had them uh, get, at, get at in front of him. One of the issues, I mean, so weapons you know, is part of being a Marine, right? We all fire our weapons, and... And there's a lot of Marines out there who have personal firearms and stuff. So one of the things we're looking at in the installation is, do we have it right? So you have a young Marine in a barracks and he has a weapon. Where does he keep that weapon? You know, you can, we say you can keep it in the armory, but then he has to get to the armory and the access to it and all that. So, you know, down at Camp Allen, down in Norfolk, they have a, a shooting range there uh, run by a, a MWR, if you will. And uh, you can store weapons there and stuff like that. So you can use it for both recreational and then for, you know, there's people that go down there and actually do qualifications and stuff like that. So we're looking at any installations, you know, maybe partnering with the, the commercial sector and have somebody like run that, and then you can safely store your weapons as opposed to maybe, you know, what the reality is, what they do is if they have a buddy out in town or something like that, would, would, would you know, store the weapon for them. And uh, we just want want them to do it right and have uh, and have control of the weapons, know where they're at and stuff like that, and have them secured properly because uh, – I think it's problematic when we ask them to go store them in the base armory. Uh, it's just not reality. Uh, they're not going to do it that way. It's hard to get to and everything else. So that's pretty much what we're doing. And, 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 and schools on bases, we have both the uh, Department of Defense schools and we have uh, regular public schools uh, on bases. Uh, and when we partner with them and we always take security of those schools and every part of base uh, uh, very important. But it gets back to my original uh, comments you know we want to have this digital fortress around the base and installation uh so not you know it's layered uh, so we can defend the installation uh, on it and then several years ago i mean we we always do it o o officer of days all our duties are armed um because uh, it's when there's going to be an incident like that the time responders can get there the military police if you will uh it'll probably be, be uh, somewhat too late and we have, we have uh, guard details, if you will, like penalty in each each installation uh, area. Uh, you know, somewhat of a tribe uh, has their own security forces within it. You know, Marines who pull duty. Just touch on Leosa. Navy, quite honestly, is still struggling with the implementation of of uh, the act and have yet to do the support Navy bases. Um, Part of this is is driven by our experience, uh, the Was Washington Navy Yard shooting, where uh, we had over 1,200 armed security officers and agents, federal, uh, local, and uh, and Navy personnel on on the base that day. So sorting out uh, the fog of war, if you will, and that type of security incident, when you add the dynamic of unknown armed people into it um, becomes problematic for us and we don't have it figured out yet so i'll just add that although we have a number of military bases we don't have any dodia schools uh, in maryland uh, but this provides an opportunity for our uh, superintendents uh, whether they be local or at the state level to partner with uh, our services here and increased communication on on what we can do to assure the military families that their children will be safe. Thanks, uh, Admiral Rock. The Army is mostly CONUS based and relying on sea lift to deploy to operational theaters. What effect 
as you, as you look at the, the theme of uh, installations of the future, um, how, do, how do you view rising sea levels and their impact on critical port, port activities? Yeah, th this, is, uh, this is a huge challenge, uh, particularly in the Mid-Atlantic and uh, uh, the world's largest Navy base in, in Norfolk that if, if you look at some of the projections in, in 30 years, uh, it will be underwater. Uh, it, it will have uh, a, a, an absolute impact on, on strategic lift, on, on uh, U.S. Navy operations, and uh, we don't have it figured out. Uh, we talk a lot about it, um, but in, in terms of any real investment in planning for the eventuality of, of, of losing Norfolk Naval Station, um, we, we've, got, we've got a long way to, a long way to go. So short answer to, to tell you that we don't know. We, we understand the problem. We don't have a solution to the problem. Uh, General Cooper, um, several panel members have mentioned partnerships with electric companies. Um, given recent Russian hacks into U.S. electric grid and, and other targets, uh, how's the Air Force look about, look toward increasing smart technologies on installations while mitigating these new security threats. Yeah, that, that is that is definitely an issue that I, I'm, uh, we are we're fully engaged uh, in addressing the in, uh, the ICS issue, industrial control systems, um, which you know you you can you can you know my my opening comments you know the bases have to provide permission. Um, you can stop an awful lot of Air Force mission uh, by by preventing power to that to that base. Um, a lot of you know, we have uh, about 25,000 airmen uh, today that are engaged in the CENTCOM fight from their home station because um, they're, they're fighting from a base that they're never going to leave from, but the, the forward deployers rely on what they're doing back <coughs> home. Um, that's what we've done over the last, you know, decades now. So that base, the base at home, has got to be as resilient as the, as the base. Uh, you know, it's much more, much easier to see a, 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 a robusted, defended base in the CENTCOM AOR than, uh, than you would in, in Virginia or um, Colorado or something like that, but we got to be as tough. So we have a lot of activity on, uh, on um, trusted foundries, trusted manufacturers. Uh, we, don't have a, we don't have a great solution to it. We're, we're working through it. Um, and I know that our, my service colleagues are all doing the same thing because we're working with OSD on a very similar activity. But, you know, the, the, the days where the, the oceans on the east and west coast protected America, our garrison bases is no longer there. Uh, the FIBA is, is in, the, in the CONUS. And for uh, Ms. Swoboda, um, given the number of federal installations in the state of Maryland, um, what is Maryland doing to protect sensitive sites from um, drone incursions? And some, if some other panel members may want to comment on that. Sure. I I don't have much to add on, on what we're doing to protect uh, on the, the bases themselves uh, from drone invasion, but we do have a, a designated um, test site in Southern Maryland. It seems to be working very well with industry partnering. Um, we're very well aware of uh, the recent regulations that are put out there, uh, whether it be by the FAA or, or locally in Maryland about drone operators. Um, we haven't had too many issues arise um, in that regard, but as you see increased um, use of drones, uh, that is certainly something that we'll, we'll have to address. Other comments on drones? So, I mean, we've had issues overseas too, so you're in another country, and uh, it's, it's a little even actually more problematic. We just re recently came out with some internal policy, kind of have you know a, somewhat of a layer of defense if they penetrate the airspace, and you always have the right to defend yourself. My concern is kind of like when you think about IEDs, how we went after that. We always look for a high tech uh, solution, and then the adversary or who's using it just does a changes it, you know, as opposed to we want to jam this certain spectrum and. They're flying it by geolocation or something like that. That doesn't, you know, it's not going to be able to jam the spectrum or something like that. So it's, a, you know, sometimes it's just, a, you know, simple kinetic 
type of solution might be a better solution than a than a zillion dollar uh, machine. You know, you think of a big shotgun. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but it, it's a serious uh, it's a serious issue, uh, and I think the stuff we maybe learn from the installation side, we can then uh, take that and use it uh, overseas uh, to fend some of our, our, our fobs or. Or, or bases when we're in uh, either in the fight or uh, or near the fight over. The the Navy recently had a drone land on a flight deck of an aircraft carrier that was anchored in Hong Kong Harbor. Um, that that uh, if that doesn't get the hairs on the back of your neck standing up, uh, I don't know what will. We do have two strategic bases from which we deploy our. Uh, Ballistic submarines from uh, Kings Bay, Georgia, and uh, and um, uh, Kitsap, Washington, um, and th th those those bases have been um, subject to um, over the last couple of years significant um, drone overflight, and we've recently installed um, systems with offensive capability and the associated policy that goes behind it to allow us to take action to protect um, strategic systems. Uh, we're just on the, the cusp of figuring out what this looks like on, on all other bases. Uh, law has uh, uh, some ways to catch up, and if you're looking at how you could help from a state perspective, uh, that, that, may be, that may be one area. Yeah, we're just going to hire the Marines and shoot them out of the sky. <laughs> the, uh, um, you know, a tremendous amount of legislation uh, positive to help us, I think, over the last two years um, uh, is allowing us to protect uh, mission areas. Um, uh, but I, I just, I'll just share because there's some industry uh, partners in here. And I think this is, a, this, is a, this is an opportunity that, that we, need to, we need to, I think, focus on. Uh, I, had to, I had to assess this, this problem recently, and I assessed that the, the, uh, the probability was high and the, uh, the, the, um, you know, the, the value proposition, the severity is, uh, is also high. And if we, if we field the systems we have now, we're just going to drop the severity, but we're still going to have the probability. So we're fielding these elegant systems for these $100 drones. Uh, I want to field $100 solutions to $100 drones or $10, $10 solutions to $100 drones. But we got to get the price point in our favor there, so maybe industry can help us to shrink. You know, I want, I want the bad guys to be the Starship Enterprise, uh, and, and we swarm them and kill them with $10 drones or something like that. Uh, right now we're using elegant solutions, and uh, to, your, you know, to your point, big shotgun might be a good idea. Everybody needs a good Marine, don't we? <laughs> and an Air Forceman, too. Um, I would say, and I just want to foot stomp uh, all of what's been said, this is a great opportunity, perhaps. We have drone policy for our installations uh, throughout the Army, but this is certainly an opportunity where industry perhaps can partner with us. And just on, an, on a more basic uh, uh, playing field, if you look at some of the things that are happening around the world, whether it be cyber attacks, hacking, uh, the newest threats even in Austin, uh, all of us have to be vigilant and aware of our surroundings, see something, say something uh, at its basic premise. So uh, this is a good one that we might come together either from a joint service perspective, which I know we are doing, uh, and also partnering with industry to help us uh, come to a good solution. Over. This uh, next question is addressed to General Bingham, but, but given that everyone on the panel has talked about partnership with industry and our audience today, I'd, I'd ask you to weigh in as appropriate. What events or exercises exist for industry to demonstrate technology and uh, where the Army can evaluate that technology? Uh, that's probably a good one. If you uh, partner with some of our research development uh, and engineering centers, there's an opportunity to demonstrate. Even within AUSA, Joe Ham, we appreciate you and uh, AUSA event that comes around in October. A lot of those demonstrations can be had. And I would just tell you, uh, I have a number of folks who come through the Pentagon, uh, not necessarily uh, have asked me to demonstrate something, but certainly it's in the realm of doable and possible. So uh, we would be amenable to that if you have something that you want to, us to uh, understand and know about. I think some of you are already taking us up on that throughout the installations we have around the world. 
but uh, if there's other um, uh, technology you want to demonstrate or you want to partner with us, we are all ears and welcome the opportunity to uh, hear you out. Thank you. Any specific opportunities for um, services or Maryland for industry demonstrations, technology demos? Well, we, I mean, we have, uh, you know, just uh, counter small uh, U.S., we had, uh, we had an industry day for that, okay? So we, we put that call out, industry came out, they showed us their wares, uh, we started working that activity. We have those all the time uh, on a lot of, on a lot of, uh, of areas like, like counter small uh, UAS. Um, but, you know, I'll go back to the way we're trying to, you know, the, my original comments, the way we're trying to change the way we think. Um, uh, uh, unit level, you know, whatever, on the edge, innovation on the edge. If, if, uh, if you're working with somebody, it's a good idea. It will make its way up to the Air Force. That's what, that's what we're promoting. So if you're working with a, with a base commander, um, that's, that's another good way to get at it. All right, I've got one more individual question before I have to go to questions for the whole panel. Um, so um, for General Colonnese, where is the Marine Corps looking to implement artificial intelligence or machine learning to drive efficiencies? So uh, like the Air Force, uh, we, we teamed with Watson to, to uh, do the analytics of our HVAC and um, down at uh, Buford, Marine Corps Air Station Buford, uh, actually where we used it, uh, we have our systems some wi all wired in the HVACs and, and control systems. And it gets pretty hot in Buford. And during peak demand, you know, it goes from like, let's say, eight cents a kilowatt. I don't know, I don't know what the cost is, but let's say to 35 cents a kilowatt. And then, then now we, right now, human being gets on, he can get on the phone and literally change, change the uh, temperature. And the cost avoidance is millions of dollars just a couple of temperature changes uh, in it. But we, we much rather have a machine doing that for us and, and take the human totally out of it uh, in, in that. And I, I think uh, AI itself, uh, controlling our systems, um, and, and, and you always have to have a, a, a oversight of, of that. But the decisions made by a machine on those type of things are, are so much better. Even turning things on, right? You know, you want to turn them in, in some of a sequence and HVACs or whatever the machines are. And then I think uh, uh, um, the other thing is you know, uh, the Air Force, you got that, 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 that picture of it. You know, one of the things is, is when we make uh, decisions on our infrastructure, it's really hard to brief, uh, right? I mean, so we're doing, over, it's over the fit up, you know, you've got Milcon, uh, Recap, Biz rim and all that, and it's hard to brief. And I really think that should be in a virtual reality type of world that you brief it in it, and and you you know you go back to the minority report. You go that, that building's gone. This goes up. That goes like that, and visually depict that installation uh, itself in it uh, because it's it's spreadsheets, powerpoints, and stuff like that. So I think there's so much there there that uh, I think it's pretty exciting. I think we've got time for one more before we close, and this is addressed to the whole panel. Um, and it's about data. So it's a, it, data is the fuel that drives resources policy decisions at the Pentagon, Congress, and OMB. This data is collected at installations through programs such as ISR, ASIP, GFEBS, um, other acronyms I cannot read. <laughs> The installations are loath to collect this data because it doesn't support providing services within the year of execution. How do we reconcile this need for data versus resistance to collect it? That's a great question. And quite honestly, I think um, maybe there's an opportunity in that question. Because when we talked in the earlier panel about, or I think Katie mentioned uh, not being a subscriber to doing more with less, uh, we certainly want to make effective use of our people's time and not uh, spend a lot of time collecting data. So I think about that from a, uh, my own foxhole in the Pentagon. I never want to ask the installations or subordinates to do something that's not worthy of their time in terms of the output. So as, as we talk about the notion of uh, big data and, and big data analytics, 
um, maybe there's an opportunity for just that purpose to how can we uh, get the information that we need without using so much of the manpower to do it. And so I would tell you, uh, partners out there, that maybe there's an opportunity to be had because we, for instance, installation status report, uh, we use that when we work through our infrastructure, understanding what the uh, state of the condition of our infrastructure is. Uh, that way we understand um, what it would take to buy out that uh, backlog, if you will, for facilities as a case uh, example in point. Maybe there's a, a better way to uh, understand the condition of our infrastructure and facilities such that we don't have to use the same number of people to be able to, uh, to um, put that information in our data bank, so to speak. So if you could help us with that uh, to be able to somehow find ways that we can use either sensors or other emerging technology to help us uh, try to um, um, build an opportunity to use less people but still have the information you need, we certainly would welcome that partnership opportunity. It's a great question. Thank you. Gerald Cooper. Uh, it, you know, it should just happen, right? Uh, this this information is there. I mean, you know, we, we get we get asked. Uh, we're, we're required to deliver reports uh, from from the Pentagon to uh, to uh, Congress. It's something like two or three hundred data points. Yeah. You know, when that, when that streams downhill, down to the base. I mean, you're talking about thousands, if not millions, an hour of hours of manpower to just to just get a big chief notebook and write these things down and then and put them in. I mean, that should just happen. So uh, it should be. Why can't we be like Walmart? Right. I mean, that's what we need to be, and I think we could do that quickly. There's, I'm sure, there's an there's industrial solution out there. So, so uh, right now we're, we're going to all our buildings with lidar uh, technology, doing space management, and all. We have all our most of our data resides on one server server farm, if you will. Um, the problem is is accessibility to it, right, and latency and everything else. So people, all our installations have to use that data too for their planning. I mean, and the installations is a long game. I mean, nothing nothing happens fast, right? It's even recaps going to be two years. Milcon's even a short game, five years, and then, so the data is really really important. And data drives drives resources, drives how we how I resource them, and if their data is wrong, you know, they might come out, you know, it'll hurt their resources. So they're interested in that data. I just don't think we have it right. I, I think that data really should be somewhat on a cloud base where it can it can move a lot faster, more accessibility, and uh, and then you can do more things with it and and get a better site picture. Some, sometimes I don't think we have a real good site picture of our index of our facilities, and and we're trying to get after that right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've got nothing of value to add other than uh, the joint the joint basing metrics are my favorite to collect. <laughs> I'll just add as it relates to, uh, you know, the more use of data and the build out of data centers before we, we make a move to the cloud. Um, as a, a best practice example, uh, back in 2014, the NSA partnered with uh, Howard County uh, to provide um, waste, treated wastewater uh, to be used to cool the NSA uh, data centers at Fort Meade. So uh, NSA, uh, along with the county, uh, funded a wastewater treatment facility that provides five million gallons of water a day to cool the NSA servers. So that's a nice visual to end with there for you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we are about out of time. General, General Bing, if you'd close this out, please. Okay, well, thank you all so much. Uh, on behalf of all of my joint service partners and Miss Lisa Swoboda up here, we want to say thank you all for spending time with us over the last hour. And the questions that you've asked us, you, you have actually gotten us to think a lot about some good uh, issues out there. So look forward to uh, continuing our engagement, our dialogue, and we'll see you after the next panel. Thank you. And thanks uh, to Keith for uh, being the great moderator he 